Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. With three World Series titles to his name, Tony La Russa is widely considered one of the best managers in Major League Baseball history. He spent 33 years as a manager, currently for the Chicago White Sox and previously with the Oakland Athletics and St. Louis Cardinals. A member of Baseball's Hall of Fame, Tony's 2,848 wins and counting rank second all time among big league managers. In our conversation today, we talk about his relentless approach to preparation, building a strong team culture, and how to inspire greatness in others. Let's go. This is my conversation with the one and only Tony La Russa. You know, Tony, you are one of the all-time winningest baseball managers and major league baseball history. Talk to me a little bit about what it takes to do that consistently, like over, you know, with different teams, different clubhouses, different guys, different GMs. Get me inside of that a little bit. Cause that's not an accident. <laughs> well, there are two answers that really apply. One of them is the, the uh, all the situations, Chicago, Oakland, St. Louis, they're remarkably similar, consistent, and that's really where the success uh, begins and is completed. I've said many times, I have, you know, over the many years, I have, some fr- I have a lot of friends that managed, uh, managed really, really well. If they had been where I was, then they would have the career wins. And if I'd been with where they are, I would not. Because to have that uniqueness of an owner that's truly committed to winning and allowing the people that work for them to do the work. And then you have a front office, which starts with a general manager, assistant general manager. And then you, you know, and the coordination with scouting and player development, that's a unique thing. And uh, trusting the guys in uniform, especially the coaching staff, because especially um, during the time that I managed, uh, that's when the free agency was at beginning and become very strong and a strong union. So a lot of players influenced by their family and friends and agents just, hey, get yours, get yours. And if they didn't like their at-bats or something about their situation, they'd reach right over you, call the owner or the general manager. And to this day, I have, the staff and I have never had one example where we were not supported by upstairs, not once. So I'm telling you, the, a very important part of this is credit to the White Sox, over the years and, and the ownership of the front office right through the coordinating Oakland days and St. Louis. I mean, it was just, I know I'm lucky I've said it. Now, for my part, I think it, it has to do with the mentors. Uh, we don't talk about my playing career, but the only thing I talk about is I played for a long time. And I was in the Oakland A system when they started coming up. A lot of really outstanding coaches. In fact, one of them I'll mention, who, uh, a lot of my philosophy of leadership is pattern after a man named John McNamara, who was a, a minor league manager for a lot of us, and he was a big league manager with the A's, Cincinnati and Boston. So I think from uh, the staff's point of view, it's always keeping the perspective that the game is really our players against their players and play in a way that entertains our fans, which is effort, execution, toughness. We believe that, that we can contribute as staff without ever getting in their way. You're a humble guy, right? You're a modest guy. Because to move around to different markets, different teams, different different clubhouses, different guys, and do that is, is remarkable. And smart are your GMs to let you, let you manage, right? I'm sure they also help put guys on the field for you. Early on in my career, which was with the White Sox, I learned the value of locker room leadership. And it was 1982, 83, we had Greg Luzinski, Jerry Kuzman, Carlton Fizz, Tom Pachorek. Uh, and these guys really, they, and they were very experienced 
they really bought into our coaches. I've got a great coaching staff. And they pretty much said, hey, look, you you know, just uh, let's get together on what's important and, we'll, and we'll, we'll take care of that clubhouse. And if there's something that uh, needs to be straightened out, we'll do our best. If it doesn't, you know, then you can be the principal and call them in the office and, and spank them, you know. So if you haven't learned it, then you're at a disadvantage. If you have learned it, then you know you've got to get those fellas to respect and trust you, show them that you care. And then let, let them help you and help your staff get the message across. You know, Tony, obviously, as a manager, you're trying to maximize talent, right? You're trying to get the most out of every single one of those 25 guys. What's been your approach to that over the years? Well, most importantly, I think, is you have to really personalize your relationship. I'm talking as a staff. I mean, you can't sit in front and, uh, and lecture. And, you know, give all these wonderful points. And the guys are just, okay, well, you know, like you're the teacher. They've been through that. The first thing you got to do is you got to establish a relationship. And it's got to be personal. I mean, it's something that you work. It's a it's a more time-consuming way to lead because you do it every day all the time. But you really work to earn their respect and their trust. And you show them you care, right? Well, if you do those things, once then you start talking about, you know, you sign a big league contract, you have talent. Now, who are the productive winning players equal teams? It's not always, not always the most talented. You have to figure a way to take your talent into skills. And, and a lot of it, this is one thing, Molly, that uh, uh, if there's one thing that has been stressed is personal accountability and the fact that you determine, you mentally determine the commitment you make to yourself as professional and to you to as, as a teammate. It isn't how fast you run or how far you can hit it or how hard you throw. So some of the guys, you know, I, I, one of my favorite examples is David Eckstein, <clears throat> who's been a two-time world champion with the Angels and the Cardinals. And David's David's talent, he's got talent. But it's, you know, it's not scary talent like, you know, Correa or some of these guys, you know, Tim Anderson. But mentally, he is as tough and as strong, and every day he's out there, effort, execution, and toughness. So, if if it's if there's something that we stress, is look you you have you have to take charge. We're here to help you where we can, but if you don't if you don't decide to make the most of your talent, and by the way, and this is one of the unfortunate things about uh, sports today, you, know, you can make a very comfortable living playing at 75% of your productivity. But if you want to be a champion, you got to get to 100%. You know, I, I always believe that people overestimate talent and underestimate drive, underestimate work ethic, accountability, a lot of those things. What are some of the ways that you help guys lean into and unlock that drive inside of them, right? Not settle for, I mean, they're obviously incredibly gifted athletes, but but to your point, the ones that stay there for more than a cup of coffee have unlocked the drive inside of them too. Try to identify, you know, what really motivates you. And and there's the uh, the golden sombrero there at the end, you know, that, that you strive for. But first, as a player, yeah, I want to get to the major leagues. I'm motivated, you know, I want to get to the major leagues. Well, you get to the major leagues. Well, you know, now I want to, Thank goodness to stay for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you're there for two or three years. Oh, man, you know, I, I, I want to, if I can get, uh, if I want to make some money. Yeah, <laughs> get to free agency. Start, you know, you're motivated to make money. And, and, and uh, well, if I can play long enough to get the pension. Well, here, here's a, none of that happens unless you understand who you are when you sign up as a professional player. You sign up as a competitor. Your job is a competition, right? It's your, it's, I mean, it's so simple, it's ridiculous. We play them, period. <laughs> so our, our team against their team and there's a score. And you're supposed to contribute. You know, contribute, commitment, that's a promise you make. And how do you do that? Well, if you're a pitcher, you make pitches. If you're a hitter, you get hits. So the motivation that you say, how are you going, how are you going to acquire that? Making a team, staying with the team, making money. You've got to be excellent at, the effort that you put into learning the game, practicing, and, and then committing to the competition. So in the end, what I think is 
and when you see it happen, man, it's it's so rewarding for the player and for a staff. If you can get them to really just focus on, I, I want to I want to compete as best I can. If you do that, you get through the distractions of oh maybe I should settle back and enjoy what I already have. No, just just compete for to be the best you can be. Sounds corny, but it works. Yeah, for sure. How would you say your guys? I mean, you've you've been in a clubhouse w- with a lot of different guys over the years. How do you think they describe? What? How do they describe your leadership philosophy, your beliefs, your approach? Oh, I make it very clear to them. For one thing, the coaches and I, you know, as I said at the beginning, you always identify that the most important people in uniform are the players. It's not the staff. It's not that we're not un- not unimportant. We have a role, and our role is to get you to play personally and pitch as good as you can and come together as a team. So what we can do as a staff is create a culture, an environment. And here again, I like to be corny because corny resonates. We we create a family kind of situation. And what do families do? Well, they love each other. And what are they, how they love each other? Because they respect and trust each other and they care for each other. So, you know, when I've answered that question before, you, you, you I, I can see that. Okay, what? Well, you know, that's all right. I, I got that. But now, how do you do it? Well, if you, if you stop and think about it, if you can create that caring thing, that family feeling, those days that you're not really sure that it, you, it, you want to go the extra mile, you look around. Yeah, hey, I got to do it for my brother. You know, and and that, the team's relying on me. So, what we try to do is we push the respect, trust, and caring, and then we. It's just like, and this is one of those, I know that, you, that you're interested in, you know, takeaways from people. Sure. You know, a, a true leader, um, the easiest thing he does or she does is, what is it that you want to get done? You know, there's a problem. What is it? Yeah. And and so you communicate and you think, okay, and you walk out, no. That's that's only a third of, the, of what you're supposed to do. The second thing you have to do, if it's not clear, is why. Why am I telling you this what is important and that's that's important some it's sometimes it's obvious the third one is the one that i think i've seen leaders uh ignore or not understand the importance of, and that is the how you just tell somebody a what why you got to give them the how so if you tell a guy look you got to be a better defender and the how is we're going to give you drills that do that you know if, if we tell them that we're going to be a a team that toughens out uh, every situation, then we have a strategy of how we deal with adversity, how we deal with pressure. So what, why, and how, what, yeah, that's anybody can do that. Why sometimes it's not, the how is the key to the kingdom. Mm-hmm. And the how makes them want to get after it, right? I mean, that makes them, I mean, the why makes them want to get after them, but they got to know how to do it, right? I. Well, that's when it's fair. Yes. If you create a what, then you should make it fair, right? You know, I, you know, the, the example that's used all the time is the owner comes down to the general manager says, man, the runners on third base are less than two outs, and we're, we stink at that. So you stand in front of the team and say, fellas, we're stinking at driving in the runner from home from third with less than two outs. Now, let's do better. You walk out. You go, what, 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 what? That's not fair. So you tell them, hey, this is how we improve at that. And they, you know, they feel like, wait, I got something I can hold on to. I can practice. And I can execute. You know, as I said, you're a Hall of Fame manager. You've had a lot of success in the game for a long period of time. You've done, you know, Tony, so much. What made you want to come back and manage again? It's easy. And that is, uh, when I talked about how fortunate I've been with the situations that my, the coaches and I've been in, right? Well, the other thing that I've been fortunate is that I was five or six years old in Tampa, Florida. Uh, my dad especially introduced me to baseball. So if you, if you count the years where I am now, uh, I have this love affair with with baseball. And you hear it all the time. If college grads will say, well, you know, hey, what do you, what should I do? If you can find the thing that you're the most passionate about, then chase that, right? Because you wake up in the morning full of you know vim and vigor, and let's go get it, as opposed to oh God Almighty, I, you know, right? Sure, I'm not really excited, but I got to go. So. I have been able, I was in uniform as a player, player coach for 16 years, but I, I've been able to stay close to this game. So even when I retired, I stayed close to the game upstairs. 
And in the end, the only thing that I feel like I enjoy doing and can help can do decently is is manage. So I, I was given this opportunity to come back. But the point is, I love the game. And here's another a takeaway for uh, for people: you always must have a thirst to learn and improve whatever it is, whether it's your craft, whether it's your leadership, whether it's whatever you whatever you the thing is you're doing, and you can't and experience of what you've gone through is a great teacher. Then there are also maybe textbooks and others successes, right? Well, I, when I first started managing, there's, there's a legendary coach with the St. Louis Cardinals named George Kissel. Famous, famous man who's obviously passed away now. And when I said I wanted to manage after I, I finished my career, he said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you love the game? Uh, yeah. I, he says, no, that's not you don't understand the way I, the way you answered. I don't believe it. Do, do you truly love the game? I said, well, I think I do. He says, well, here's a formula. If you really want to learn the game for the rest of your life, it requires that you love it. And then you have this cycle. And this is, it's a beautiful thing. If it's something that you love and you learn about it, the more you learn, the more you love it. it makes you want to <laughs> learn more, right? Yeah, sure. So I, I think one of the secrets is this continual pursuit of, of, of knowledge. I mean, you went upstairs, right? As you alluded to, how has that helped you as a manager, right? I mean, that's a big shift. I mean, you go upstairs and now you're back down on the field again in the clubhouse again. Tell me about that. I think it had more to do with my appreciation for everybody else that's in the game. You know, I, mean, I was in uniform a long time. You know, I started managing and, and you have your own little cocoon down there. You know, you know, there's an organization all around you. And that beyond that is your organization. There are 29 others, and that's led by Major League Baseball. So it, uh, when I first left, uh, just like Joe Torre, uh, Commissioner Seeley wanted us to stay in the game, so we worked. Joe ran uh, baseball operations in my leagues. I was just special assignments. But I saw, I saw what New York, well, not New York, what MLB is about. You know, the international part of it. You know, all the people working behind the scenes to make the game work. And then I had my chance to go upstairs with uh, the Diamondbacks. Uh, and I was with Boston in 18 when they were, I was, I was an advisor the year they won 117 games of my advice. You guys, here's my advice, Molly. You guys are really good. Just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> I, I, I didn't do anything. And they're like, why are we paying you, man? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I, I probably should have given a check back. But I got a ring. And then I go to Boston and uh, I mean to one year at uh, L.A., what you learn is how difficult the jobs are administrating from the front office, bringing in the whole thing. You understand more. We, I always appreciate it, but I didn't understand just how tough the job of scouting is, whether it's amateur or professional. Player development, that's, that's one of the keys to winning. But they, they probably get least credit than anybody, and they, they're down there digging. They don't make enough money. And they worked long hours to, to give these the young players the beginning of, 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 of it all. So it helped me understand, you know, the, just the breadth of who's involved the game, how much, how important they are. And, and, the mo and then the other thing that I learned, that's why when I had this chance to go back downstairs last year, I did. When you're upstairs, you want to win. The general manager, front office, but they, they want to win as much as you do downstairs. But once the game starts, they're absolutely helpless. It's like torture. Right. <laughs> Downstairs, yeah, at least you figure you can make a, a decision, bad or good, but at least you're, you got a chance to contribute. Hi there, it's Molly. I've got some really exciting news to share with you. I'm launching my first ever on-demand course that's crafted to help you up your game. It's crafted to help you unlock the drive to fuel next level success. Go to mollyfletcher.com backslash waitlist to join the waitlist, and you'll be the first to know when the new course launches. Again, that's mollyfletcher.com backslash waitlist. Are you ready to up your game? Sign up today. You know, over six decades in the game, how has your leadership style evolved or has it? I think 
uh, because of my time in uniform, that you know, growing up with the A's and so forth, and the managers I played for and coaches, I think a, 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 the foundation of the leadership it hadn't really changed at all. What you, as part of the staff, want to do, you want a fan to come to watch your team and see that they care about the effort they give. There's nothing, well, I shouldn't exaggerate, but one of the things that really upsets fans when they go out there and see a nonchalant team going through the motions, right? So effort, and then if you're going to play, if you're going to give effort, I, I, I had a lot of effort, but I, my execution was horse manure. Yeah, 199 I saw, man. 199, right? Was your average? Oh, yeah. I'm going to hang up on you right now. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> and it wasn't even a hard 199. <laughs> Very soft. So, uh, and the execution, that's what, you, you know, yeah, in baseball, sure. if you got talent, it's not that you play hard, you got to execute. Yeah, sure. And the toughness. So that part of it, playing as a team, when I got into managing the American League in 1979, just painfully said my about my playing career i had like there's nothing like what could i coach nothing and i didn't manage that long but the guys in the, and and people that were sort of here that they may not even recognize things i want to tell them mm -hmm. but in our time in the late 70s 80s these guys managers recognized by the first name whitey sparky billy yeah earl <laughs> gene so they all mentored me. That's where I learned, you know, the foundation of play as a family, play as a team, play hard, play the game right. And what you, I think probably what I've learned over the years have, has been uh, what the distractions are to that now. You know, fame and fortune. Lately in 2000, uh, this is a key point to make, uh, there was potentially a very healthy addition to to uh, baseball, including sports, and that is the increased information that you use to get ready. Now, what's happened is, and I don't blame them, a lot of these uh, folks that have come in with information have really embraced this opportunity, and they push, 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 and sometimes they don't know what they don't know, which is that once the game starts, it's not percentages. You know, it's hearts beating and guts and but I think that uh, the, the, our game right now is going through a real adjustment period, trying to balance all this wonderful information in a useful way so that the game is better and not stagnant or going, going in the wrong direction. Well, and for a guy like you, right, I mean, balancing that data, all that information with just, just reps of managing and seeing guys and knowing what they need. I mean, that's got to be – I'm sure you juggle that incredibly well – but that's, that's a different juggle than you had 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Yeah. To this day, in 1971, I know when Dick Williams started to manage the A's, mm -hmm. and he managed seven, one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. And I actually made that club. So I was there for a while before I got sent out. So I was not there when they won the World Series of two and three. But I had a strong relationship with Dick. And when I started managing and I asked for help, he gave me a great tip about no matter how much pre preparation you have, he says, Always take time after the game is played to review the game. Mm -hmm. The best learning experience you can have is because you go in with a plan, how you're going to pitch against them, how you're going to hit against them, and then you play the game. If you just review, hey, how, what was our plan? What looked good, what didn't? So you study them, you study us, and then you study how the game was won and lost. See? My point, I love saying this point because it's been – so for 5,000 games that I've managed, I have taken the time afterwards, and I enjoy doing it because I know there are real nuggets, gold, that you can, if you take the time to examine them, us, and how the teams competed, you know, what, how you won or lost, it will help you over the time. So the reason I, bring, I go to depth to that is that is the experience of the game. If you bring in the added, and there are some wonderful formulas now that you can get ready to compete. If you put both those together, then you're, you're going to help your team more. Mm -hmm. you're, if one ignores the other or disrespects the other, then you're not going to do as well as you can. When you come into a new situation, Tony, like you come into a new situation, a new clubhouse, 
I mean, where they need change, right? I mean, that's why they've brought in a new manager, right? I mean, there's a, there's a change that's happening where they need the change. What's maybe the first, second, and third thing that you do? When you walk into that clubhouse, you got 25 new guys leaning into you to be their skipper. Get me inside of that a little bit. Well, the first time with Chicago, Oakland, St. Louis, the t- clubs are struggling, which is how you usually get a job. I want to make sure I make it clear. I walked <laughs> into the White Sox in 2021, and they were a really good club. They liked each other. They liked to compete, liked to price. I, I mean, I walked into something that proves again how lucky I've been. If the club is struggling, I think you need to really examine why they're struggling. Sometimes it's mental. Sometimes you can see that, you know, some particular part of the game, they're inadequately preparing and competing. Maybe they're the talent is short. So you you come with a fresh look and you do this, you know, the things we just talked about, you know, just analyze you know, what, what the talent is and how you can make them better. I'll give you one. And when I walked in this year, well, not last year, spring of 2021 to the White Sox, you learn the value. And, uh, and I'll honor a guy that's actually being, uh, they're having a service for tomorrow, John Madden. And yeah, John Madden lived on her <clears throat> in Northern California. So I had lunch with him a bunch of times. And he gave me one of the best tips ever. Uh, in 1983 with the White Sox, we had a really good year. In 84, we didn't. And I stunk as a manager because I didn't understand the carryover after an exciting win. I said, you know, you got to get to zero every year you start at zero. And we started at zero since so I walked in that day. I said to them, it's, it's what you're doing with the job this year now, right? I'm starting at zero with respect, trust, and caring. And as a team, they had gotten into the playoffs for the first time in a while. You need to understand there's no carryover except that you should be confident that you're good enough. But everything starts at zero. And my best answer to you is that whether it's your first time in that club that's struggling, whether they're ready to win, or if you've been there 10, 16 years like I was, you put brand new, you check every box, earn respect, trust, caring, the basics of the game, strip the competing, and more than anything, you really embrace the family feeling and make you guys feel like they need to be accountable to each other. You know, I love what Dabo Sweeney told me once on the show, head coach at Clemson, he said, serve their heart, not their talent. And it's fun when you hear guys like you and Dabo talk about things like love and family. I mean, and, and, and that's Dabo style, right? I mean, serve their heart, not their talent, which is an odd thing to hear from a coach, right? I mean, because you want them to perform. It's like, I'm, I'm going to go write that down. It's good, isn't it? Love I'll text it, it to you. Their heart, not their talent. I mean, that's yeah. That's what we're talking about. You that's know? right. That's right. You've you got, you got to get guys on a personal basis to embrace their chance to be great and their chance to compete. You know, like I said, if you want to be selfish, you play tennis or golf. This is a yeah. team sport. <laughs> That's right. One of the things that we stress a lot is that talent. We all have the same talent starting out in the mind. Each of us can decide how deeply they want to commit, how consistently they want to use their mind to be productive and helpful. And if you get lazy, it's because you, you allow yourself to get lazy. If, if you know, if it's so, I think the more that you understand accountability and and by the way, once you once you challenge your mind, it's amazing how deep and how strong it is to help you through situations. Sure. It sure is. It's so powerful. You know, one of the things I think sometimes is that success can breed complacency, you know, and you and you sort of alluded to that earlier. What have you seen to be harder, right? Building a championship culture, right? A winning culture or keeping it? Right, you're you're walking into a a contender now, right? But you've certainly walked into to different situations. What's your take on that? Well, that's a good question because uh, I think the uh, the answer would be be kind of flexible, depending on the the players that you have and how you got there. I remember reading Pat Riley's book Showtime years and years ago. He talked about coming in after a good season. And he called it the disease of more. And all these guys that were very unselfish, now they come in there and say, look, I want more touches, more this. You know, my 
I got to make more money and, and, and they lose that edge. I, I think it just depends. If, if, if the club is really a serious rebuild, it's going to take you several years of not just their mind, but you know, improving the talent. That's a really hard way because you've got to stay positive and keep them knowing moving forward. See if they're managed when things are, when, you know, when you got something that you believe in already, if you're trying to develop it. But I think your, your question is going because there isn't anything automatic about the next year after you've had a good one. In fact, most commonly, that's why you see very few repeats. Most commonly, there is a tendency to lay back a little bit, come back, you know, we call it digging ourselves. We have t-shirts. We say, you know, dig ourselves, dig, dig me like I dig myself. You know, <laughs> that, that's, that's not the attitude you want. Yeah, no, it's so true. I mean, you, you see guys go two different ways, right? Even out on the PGA Tour, you see a guy win. And then sometimes you see him relax. Now they've got a job for five years. They've got security or two years, whatever it is. And then you see them blow, go, right? They're more locked in. They're more relaxed. They're focused. And then you see guys win and they you don't hear from them again, right? Because that success spread that complacency maybe. Well, that, I mean, that's, that's a good example because in our, in our lifetime, I uh, had a very good fortune uh, because the Cardinals would train in Jupiter and right down the street is the bear and the golden bear who is Barbara, just most wonderful people that uh, we've become friends with. And, uh, and, you know, he had that inner drive to be great. And once you have it, you know, what's next, what's next tiger <clears throat> mentally <clears throat> tiger's got you know, a sandy towel, but mentally he's, just he's one of one of the poster boys for getting your mind right. And then you watch guys on the tour now that, that win, they get, you know, you get famous, you make money, you lose an edge. And and that there's there's a word that we have used for years because it, I think it resonates with players. When I think about an edge, you can feel it's just like one of those uh uh, intangible, t- tangible, intangibles. Yep, yep, for sure. What you want to do is you always want to pursue the edge. You know, maintain the edge, maintain whatever your edge is. Do you work harder? Or are you tougher? You know, more dead, whatever it is. You know, do you want to win two or three in a row? Here again, I go back to what I said before. The edge comes through your mind. It may be at, at times, maybe your knees are hurt, you can't run as fast, or your arm, you know, and, and you have to potentially your talent to understand that, but Generally, the mental edge is what you, what we coach from day one. What are some of the things, Tony, you do and you coach to to get people to, to lean into strengthening their mind? What are some of the tactics that you use? I think it's part of that personalizing relationship. You know, just leadership is an art. But how do you challenge in a positive way, which starts with, I believe in you, I believe in you, but you, you can't say you're doing something right when they're doing it wrong i mean like bull in a china shop and you step all over them because they're doing it wrong and you lose them you lose your relationship so i think there's an art to you know we call it pet and pop mr ryan sort of taught me that one you pet a guy on the back and you pop them <laughs> but the truth I pet them, but you know i believe in you right yeah yeah so i said very clearly two or three times the game is the players but i have great 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 respect for the uh, the contributions that coaches, coaching staffs make to put players in their in their place, and I mentioned earlier, and how that how important that whole organization is in the process. You've been inside of the clubhouse with, with with some studs, right? Just some absolute studs. What are some of the similarities in the best, right? That that I mean, beyond the obvious, right? That they're grinders, that they put in the work, that they're always learning, that they that they go the extra mile, that they have the mind. What are the things that you see as just the common thread between these the best? I would separate the best producers and the best teammates. The best producers, you know, they have this very demanding routine they need to get through to produce in baseball 162 times, football, you know, 17 times in playoffs, 82, you know. So it's like sometimes, uh, you know, maybe somebody covering the club, you know, well, that, you know, he's, I'm not, the guy's never, yeah, Albert Poole is a good example. You know, hey, I, it's hard to get around Albert. Well, Albert shows up at two o'clock and he has this whole routine that he does from two to seven. 
getting them ready to be productive. I mean, it is discipline and it's not easy. And he's not sitting there watching TV and, you know, eating two or three times, right? So there is the productive part of it that you have to understand. And, and as a coach, you, you know, you can support as best you can. But I think the truly great ones are great teammates. And, you know, it's a saying you've heard many times, Molly, which is a great player makes his teammates around him better. Sure. All right. Well, he may make them better just because they follow his example. Well, they're not going to have his talent, right? So that's really how he makes teammates better. He makes them better because he cares for them. He tries to, you know, if they're struggling, he tries to be there for them. I mean, a true teammate embraces the whole thing of greatness not just his personal uh, production, but what how productive the team is. And one of the great examples, I mean, at the at the documentary on on the last dance with Michael. Sure. What Michael did to keep his team hungry and and chasing the prize and chasing the prize. If a guy is very productive, pitcher or player, and couldn't care less about his teammates, if he's good enough, yeah, you know, you take him. But it's better if he also cares about his teammates. And that's why that family feeling is so important because pretty soon, you know, that, that brother that's over in the corner and nobody wants to be around, humanity means, hey, yeah, I want to be part of it. I, I want to be part of that conversation. Well, you know, part of it, then, then do the things that, that, uh, that we want, that we need done, not just what you need done. So we're going to end with rapid fire. I'm going to hit you with some quick ones and you just tell me what comes up. One word to describe yourself. Relentless. One word others would use to describe you. Teammates or opponents. (laughs) Let's go with both. (laughs) I think the opponents would say, I don't think he has a personality. Okay. And I think our teammates would say, you know, he's a good dude. What's your most memorable career moment so far? (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's just like, you have kids or you have dogs, you know, which one's your favorite? Yeah, okay. We, we, and bless, you think about it, I had moments with each of those places and, and, and picking the most, I think the most, you know, surprising fantasy island was was the last one with the, with the Cardinals when I told management, my family, that I was going to retire, like in July with family in August with the front office and somehow we win the World Series. I mean, it's, it's like somebody said, hey, quit on top. No, I, uh, we were lucky to win that year. Yeah, you're a humble guy. What's one habit that's improved your life? Reading. My mother especially got me on reading when I was a kid. And, and my friends all know, you will never see me anywhere without a book. And so if all the years on those planes and in those games, like last night when I went to dinner, I had my book. So reading, I think, besides, like during the winter, I read you know, a lot of stuff to get better, learn. Mm-hmm. And once the spring starts, I'd read nothing my fiction. But I think reading is a wonderful way to not just learn, but relax and, and, and keep you fresh. What, what are you reading right now? It's a book by uh, Ted Bell, a new one. But, you know, I have a whole book, you know, Lee Child. I was, I mourn the fact Vince Flynn was a world of great books that passed away. So what's your favorite leadership book of all time? Oh, well, I got a bunch of them. I'll tell you one of the, one of the ones I'll say is uh, Lou Holtz. Lou Holtz, had, he wrote two or three of those. There there's a lot of pearls, you know. I used one the other day, one of our coaches, you know, Lou, would come up with something like, I have a new one every year, like, our key this year is win. What's important now? Yeah, right. I mean? Yeah, sure. And uh, this past year with the White Sox, you know, we lost our whole outfield. From for half a year, right? Yeah, injuries left and right, and 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 the club was so courageous, you know, and so tough, and never give in. And the only thing I said was dur- during that time, you know, how we get through it. Our strategy for adversity is you you concentrate on what you have, not what you don't have. Yeah, which to to me is control the controllables, which I think great managers, great leaders, great coaches talk about all the time. Control what you can control because there's so much we can't. So what's the best advice you've ever received? Love the game and learn it. Love it. 
Awesome. So the show's called Game Changer. So one last question. Who or what is a game changer? So somebody that's a game changer in your mind who inspires you and maybe why? Well, based on what we've just been talking about for this time, somebody whose mind is clearly so clear with purpose, so clear with the process to be great, and so clear about going after next, going after next, going after next. So, you know, whether it's the success of Bill Belichick or, or Nick Saban or, you know, Tiger Woods, Jack Nicholas, you know, and if you see it on a one-year basis, that impressed me. If you see it, like I mentioned David Eckstein, you know, but you see somebody who takes his mind and owns it and then does the same not just for his professional life, but his personal life. Those are the people that I uh, I learned from. All right, here are a few of my favorite nuggets, favorite takeaways from my conversation with Tony. Number one, get back to zero. Tony talked about the importance of creating respect, trust, and real caring inside of a clubhouse. I love especially how he talked about get back to zero, meaning that these are fundamentals you consistently have to work on, just like physical skills. Creating a safe clubhouse, a place with mutual respect and caring, it's huge to win in ballgames. Number two, find your edge. Find your edge. What's your mental edge? Do you work hard? Are you tougher? Are you more competitive, more passionate? Find your edge, pursue it, and then maintain it. Number three, do you make your teammates better? Tony talked about how a good teammate embraces the totality of greatness, not just his personal production. A great player, the Jordans, the Bradys of the world, they produce at the highest level but they make their teammates, the players around them, they make them better too. Do you make your teammates better? What a great question to consistently ask ourselves. Great takeaways from the one and only Tony LaRusso. Thanks as always for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There, you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. This episode was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. Check it out. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.